So why don't we give just a crazy, crazy edge welcome to Mr. Anthony Trucks. It's gang time. I'm a hey, hustler, baby. Yo, Why you think on, they pay me? Let me know on, when you're ready to yeah, roll. Yeah, Do a yeah, hundred uh, eighty in yeah, the gray Mercedes. Yeah, yeah, beach, uh, they love me the yeah. most, and All you know right. they gon' watch me ballin'. Like Michael fun. Jordan, and always be like be seated. Like oh, I love this. All right, we're gonna have some fun. Uh, here's here's the thing. I I have no idea what's really gonna come out of my mouth in the next like sixty minutes. So so part of that is one. I am not a, uh, a polished speaker. I'm good. I'm not going to lie, I'm good. But I, I love to have a conversation. And I don't want to talk at you, but I want to connect to your heart. And the only way I can do this is to really just open mine. So I want to ask for permission to just be me. Is that okay? Yeah. Beautiful. And then let me do my thing. Because I'm, I'm going to give you guys some, some golden nuggets of weirdness. Because my whole thing is this, is I realized that you all traveled and took time out of your life. So I'm not just here taking moments and minutes. This is your life. And I take a great deal of responsibility internally and respect and gratitude for you doing that. So just the fact that you're here giving to yourself, I'm going to make sure every moment I give you is worthwhile. Is that cool? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to do this. You're going to hear me say, say Nux. You guys doing Nux? All right. Like this song, Nux, if you bump, right? That whole song. So Nux means you give Nux to the person next to you. The reason I want you to do that is to basically realize the person sitting next to you is also a human. And we're here connected as a group. So try it real quick. Just find someone. Give them some Nux real quick. There you go. So if I say Nux, you just do Nux just like that. Those of you guys who didn't do it, do it. If you're new to it, you're welcome. All right. So let's take a seat. Let me get my clicker. Let's go to work. I'm going to get a sip of water because I already feel myself getting cotton mouth. Hold on. Yeah. So legitimately, we just filmed Ninja Warrior in Los Angeles. Set closed at 5 a.m. My flight was at 6.50. I sprinted to Burbank Airport. I got on a plane. I landed and I got here. So I'm still fresh off of weird lights and water. And yeah, I hit the water. Different conversation. And I can't, I can't tell you anything about it because they'll sue me for a million dollars. And unless you're going to give me a million dollars, I'm not telling you. All right, so let's do this. Get notes out. So my whole thing is this. One, to take that edge off, I am just here to teach you. Teach you from my life, teach you from my research, from my clients, to teach you some things that I believe our industry and our society is sometimes missing, but it's tied a lot to identity, who we see ourselves to be. I'm going to unpack it for you. So here's a question I want you to think about as we get going. Simple question is, what promise did your creator make to the world when they created you? It's an interesting question somebody posed me at one point and just locked. Because you are here because a promise was made to our world for you to do something. Who gets that? Yeah, you get like, you, you're created for something different. We've heard it before, right? But there's a specific promise. Maybe it's to be a great coach, a great mom, a great dad, a great speaker, who knows what it is. If you get that, get a person some nuts next to you. Say, yeah, I'm here. There's a promise made, right? So write the question down. Think about that. Because that's where I want you to start thinking your brain wise. Like, why in the world was I really created? What promise was made to the world for me being here? Now, I know for me, the promise was something that I kind of didn't realize early on. So my first memory of childhood as a kid, as an individual, was sitting in my front of apartment. And I had just playing with crayons about three years old. And I remember hearing my mom call my name. So I get up. I walk to the back of the apartment. And I go out in the back, and my mom, she's standing there in a white shirt, blue jeans. Uh, my mom is white, so she, you know, white face, dark brown hair down to about here, and she's crying. I have no idea why she's crying, but I remember walking out, and she kind of comes over to me, takes my right hand, leans down, gives me a kiss, and hands it to a strange woman standing next to her. I don't know this woman. She's not smiling, like really stoic face. And then she walks me over to a black crown Victoria that looks just like this vehicle you see. She puts me in the car, buckles me in. I'm looking at the pastor side door to my mom who's still standing there crying. And I don't know what's going on. It's just like a weird kind of internal feeling. I still know what it feels like. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I start hearing like these sounds of cries. I look in the backseat of the car and I see my three siblings in the backseat crying. 
The lady walks around, gets in the car, starts it up, and we drive away. I was being put into foster care. My mom didn't love me enough to keep me. And that's the first start of my life. So early on, I identified with not being worthy. Anybody had that film before? I don't feel like I'm worthy. I don't feel like I'm good enough. I don't know what's going on. I have no idea what tomorrow brings for me. For the next three years of my life, I bounced around from foster home to foster home. Uh, unfortunately, in this time frame, foster care was like a paycheck. You get this kid, they live with you. There's no cell phones, there's no video, there's no nothing technology-wise. So whatever happens to me, as long as I don't die, life's okay. They get a paycheck. Some families would starve me. Some would beat me. There was a time when I was put into a chicken coop and made to chase chickens to earn my meal for the night. There's a home where I was put in a shopping cart and forced to go down a hill careening towards moving traffic just to fall out of the cart, screaming and crying, to get put back in and over and over keep pushing down. One family put me on the curb in front of the house, the foster brother, and forced me to lick the neighbor kid's shoes as they lined up. I was at six years old. So for me, in like those moments that I think back, it's like I didn't feel good enough in any way. That was who I identified with. I didn't think I deserved anything. And some of you feel that way, right? We feel as though because these things are happy, these emotions, we don't deserve something. So why work for it? Why should I have that thing? So I got put into a home. At six years old, I finally ended up in a unique home, which you'll see in a moment why it's unique. I'll tell you right now. This is my family. Hey! If you can't tell, I'm up in the right corner. That's me. I, I blend in the background. It's a very unique situation, but this is, my, this is my family. So again, my identity is a little bit like, like discontinued and disconnected because I'm like, well, I don't know who I am, where I came from. This is my family, but it's not my family. I don't look like them. Like, there's a lot of disconnection. Whoever at some time felt like I don't feel truly settled inside. Like, it's like a, a separation of like, I know what I'm supposed to be doing, but I don't. I want to do this. I'm not doing it. Wow, where do I sit? And I had, that, for a lot of years, had the same thing going on. Then I got to a point where... After eight years in this foster home, never having any idea for sure if the pillow I woke up on is the same one I'll go to sleep on, 14 years old, I stood up in front of a judge, looked my real mom in her eyes and said, I no longer want you to be my mom anymore. Severed parental rights, finally got adopted. Think about it. 14 years old. I had no idea up to 14 if the house I'm in today will be the one I'm in tomorrow. Completely unsettled. But here's the cool thing. After that took place, I got an opportunity to do something that opened my world. Now, for a lot of people, it's not a big deal. But I finally was able to hit someone as hard as I could and not get in trouble. I kid you not. Hey, you get it now. Oh. <laughs> I don't actually hit people in the face. I'd go to jail. I wouldn't be here. I'd be in jail. Uh, this was the first chance I had to start anchoring who I was as a human. I had a chance to go out and do what I wanted to do, to feel free. Like, who knows that thing of freedom? Like, when I get this thing, I'm doing it, it feels good. You're like, ah, I love this thing. Who has something they love? Do you say, yeah. yeah. Right? I love something. Could be a mom, dad, husband, job, career, being here right now. You're here because you want the edge, right? You want that thing to give you something unique and different because you want more. But here's the truth. Sometimes what you want, you suck at. To be honest, you start, you're horrible at it. I was horrible at football at this time. I'm like 14, my, my, you know, all my teammates are like seven years deep. I can't catch a cold. I don't know what's going on. That's football terms for it. couldn't catch a football. In case you didn't know, right? So I don't know what's going on. And like, I just, I'm settled, but like, I really am horrible at this sport, but I love it so much. So what I did was make excuses for why I wasn't going to do it. You ever had that happen? I love that thing. I try it. I'm not successful. I don't want to look bad. Oh, you know what? It's, it's the economy. It's down. It's bad, you know. I was my shoes that day. They didn't like my shoes, so I couldn't go speak. The speech was ruined because my, my shoes were the wrong side. Like, we make dumb excuses that we can feel better for so we can sleep at night. But then at a certain point, I had this realization. What happened was I got to this moment, high school, freshman year, two years of sucking at football, I was like, I'm done. I'm done with this. At the same time, my adoptive mom got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So family-wise, the focus goes to her. I'm just kind of floating there. And I start thinking about myself. I'm like, you know what? Like, I'm this foster kid. Yeah, I'm in this adopted, like, weird situation family-wise. 
I'm not supposed to do well. Most people don't know, but if you look at statistics, any prison in America, 75% of the population there are former foster kids. 51% of our homeless population, former foster kids. 1%, less than 1% of kids that grew up in my environment will ever graduate from college. I'm not supposed to do well. I'm not supposed to be here. On paper, I'm a weird oddity. I just don't exist. Like, oh, foster kid, and then NFL, and then this Ninja Warrior stuff, and speaking, like, not in prison. It's seriously odd to me. And, and I'm going to tell you how it all turned into what it is, but that's kind of what the world I live in. And I got to this point where I was in this battle internally. I had this fight I was fighting. Like, I, I want something, don't know what to do with it. I feel separated. So what did I do? I made an excuse. I'm a foster kid. I don't deserve this. And then I'm sitting in a class. Mr. Howell's English class. He was a cool teacher. Here's this weird rule he had. If you finish all your schoolwork by the end of the year, you got a grade. So if I did nothing all year and just got it done on the last day, you still could get an A. Stupid way of teaching. I didn't get it. I really, but I played the system. So I would sleep through all the classes. And I sat in the back row, right corner desk one day. And I'm, I would bring this black parka and put it over my head. I'd get a, brag, a baggie of cinnamon toast crunch cereal because it's the best cereal in the world. I don't care what you, Lucky Charms close second, but cinnamon toast crunch. So good, the milk at the end of it when you, you know what I'm talking about? You get it? Yeah. So I'm sleeping and some girl is talking to another girl and they're both right next to me. They have no idea I'm listening. And one girl says to the other girl, well, the reason I'm so bad is because I'm in foster care. And for you, it may not mean anything, but for the first time I heard my excuse out loud and it sounded like horseshit. I was like, this is a stupid idea. They challenged, without even knowing it, challenged my self-identity, my self-concept for who I was. And I heard out loud, I was like, that's stupid. That's a dumb idea because I was there. I have to end up over here. And we know that, but it doesn't logically settle in until sometimes you hear somebody say something that just sounds so odd out of the, it's like, that is, that's super weird. So as I'm sitting here with this thought in my head, that whole entire school day, I was like thinking in my head, is that who I want to be? Is that the future I want to have? And I realized it wasn't. I had a choice. You can go one of two ways. One, you can say, you know what? I'm going to go down this path and go this dark direction. I'm going to choose to go this way that's not going to lead great. Or I challenge myself to go opposite. And it's a tough challenge because here's the thing. Whenever you know who you are, it's, it's a separation to go somewhere else because you have to lose who you are to become somebody new most of the time. Right? It, 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 your old self, you have to give them up to become the new self, so to speak. So I'm in this space of like, what do I do with this? And then really inside of me, something shifted. I said, you know what? I got to figure out how to change and see myself differently to become the person I need to be, like who I needed to be. Because for us, if we just stay with the same person, stay in the same space, we get the same results we have. Who here has tried a bunch of stuff, bought a bunch of programs, got a bunch of courses, but still is in that wall, a stagnated wall, right? We put a lot of money on things. We don't come through to the back end. It's tough. It's like, I'm trying so hard. Nothing's working out. And I rise to the separation. This is where we're going to get in some work. So take notes on this stuff because it's going to open up some ideas and some doors for you. There are four separate stages to who we figure ourselves to be. Not what we do. Make sure the distinction is not what you do, but who you are. So there's who you think you are. If I asked you, hey, who are you right now? You might give me a response. I don't know what it would be, but you might give me a specific response. But then who's had somebody tell you something about yourself that you don't like? Talk too much. You, you, you control the conversation. You're super loud, bro. Why are you always talking so loud? Like certain, that's me. Just so you know, that's me. Uh, yeah. I talk a lot. My best friend, I have to actively enter the conversation and choose not to speak because I talk way too damn much. So there's a different section, right? That's who I really am, who I think I am, who I really am. And if you don't know who you really are, you can't change anything because you will never address the, the wall of who you actually are so you can change something. You'll never give yourself permission to be better if you don't own up to who you are now. 